Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. There are characters, there are individuals in New York City. There are life stories of people, you know, and I've done many of them, but it really is an honor for me to tell the life story of a friend of mine who I've known for close to 30 years, the kid from the Bronx, the real estate developer, the owner of property, the restaurateur, but more important, the, ph the philanthropist, my friend Arnold Penner. Great to have you here. Thank you, Michael. So, Arnie, you know, it was Ethel and what was it? What Harry. Was, Harry. Harry or Henry, whichever way. Okay, well, uh, Ethel and Her yeah. Henry. Yeah. And Ma he, Pop was a, what, a welder? Welder. He was, he was a welder. Mom was a milliner. And she got paid by the piece, by right? By the piece, by the piece. You were the only kid. I was the only kid. Right, but when you were a kid growing up in the Bronx, one of your jobs was what? In the candy store? I worked in a candy store on Elder Avenue probably from the time I was 13 years old until I went to college. And I got to tell you something, it was wonderful. You got to be the mayor of the street, you knew everybody, you got paid, it was fun. Did, did you put the uh, p newspapers together? I put the newspapers you together. You remember that was an important thing on Absolutely. Saturday night to put the newspapers I, together? Not only that, I had, I had to count the open packages to make sure that the paper guy didn't cheat us out of a couple of papers at two cents a paper. Because if he cheated us out two cents of paper, my boss would get crazy. Now, wait, but didn't you have another job also? Yeah. What was the other job? I worked up on Boston Post Road in a, in a home improvement store where we did, uh, we rebuilt uh, sewing machines. We, uh, we, we installed um, uh, showers in, in projects that didn't have showers. You put the thing in the, in the, in the bottom and you hook it up to the top. And we also would uh, install awnings. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was... Uh, on Boston Post Road in East Chester Road. I probably did that until I was uh, probably uh, 19 years old. I, I probably did it while I was going to college. So now, before you get to college, yeah. you're one of the Monroe kids. You went yep. to the, the, the famous Monroe High School. James Monroe. Were you involved with anything? No, not really. I just, I just loved the school. It was a great school. I graduated in 54. We had great teachers. We had great students. Um, I still stayed attached to the school after all these years. Um, my attachment sort of, uh, sort of uh, dissipated. Uh, there, there was a guy, um, I, I, Ira, um, I forget his last name, but Ira, myself, and Steve Siegel, who also went to Monroe, and he graduated a couple of years after us, we really stayed close to the school. We supported their baseball team. We, 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 gave, them, we gave them incentives for, for students who, who did well, uh, except uh, what's happened over the years it's it's continued to uh, to decline. So, so you, you graduate Monroe, 
And you decided to be, you wanted to be an engineer? My mother told me I was supposed to be an engineer because I, I was very mechanical. So I went to City College. Went to City College Uptown. 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 Remember, uptown. you weren't allowed to come to the borough of Manhattan uptown. at that time. I you didn't know where Manhattan was. Uptown. You never learned about Manhattan. Never learned. And, and City College, it was a, a one-year situation. I, I stayed there for one year. I used to drive to school. And if I couldn't get a parking space, I would, I would usually go home. So I, I didn't do too well. Um, so then you decided maybe I'll come to Manhattan, and you went to City College downtown. So let me go downtown. Downtown was easy. You took a train. But see, going to Uptown was much more exciting. I, I, I used to wait for a parking space. And one day, I, I had this, 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 uh, this hot rod that I built. I built a 47 Plymouth, a custom car. It was gorgeous. It had seam fenders, seamless fenders. had uh, a special engine. It, it was a, a pearl white car with a black top. It was really a super looking car. So I'm waiting outside of uh, Army Hall for a parking space, because if I don't get a parking space, I'm going home. And this guy pulls up in, in a... Um, like a 40 Lincoln Continental, if you know that. It was a two-door car. It was either a convertible or a coupe, but this was a combination. This was a Sedanka. Had a, had a, a back over the passenger and an open front. And, and it was a very weird-looking, strange-looking guy. This guy gets out, very distinguished guy, and he, he's going to walk into, into Grand Army Hall, whatever it was called, Army Hall, and he sees my car, and he walks around my car, and he looks at my car, and he says, young man, he says, is this your car? This is my car. I said, yes, this is my car. This is a beautiful car. Oh, I said, thank you. That was Raymond Lowy. After he left, I went home. I had my day. Yeah, I didn't did. need any more. So what happens after your completion of your second year of college? So what happened? Where, where, where'd you go? You, With you, can't, no, you had grown up that you didn't, the candy store was enough. No training. No, no more training. No, no background, nothing. I love cars, so I went to work on 67th Street and 2nd Avenue for a company by the name of Royal Buick. Now, people would, would not believe that on 67th Street, on the east side and 2nd Avenue, there was a Buick field. Yep, he was there for many, many years. Milton Gould owned the place. He was a super boss, and, and I worked there for several years before I went to the Army. Then I worked there for a couple of years. So after. You, you, you were a new car salesman? I was a new car salesman. Uh, whatever we had, but basically a new car salesman. So you went to the Army, went to Fort Dix. Went to Fort Dix. You were in the Army months, Reserve. Spent six months in Fort Dix, came back, uh, went back to work at, uh, at uh, Royal Buick. And, uh, and then finally you sold the car. And I sold the car to a guy who was in the fur business. Al, Al um, I forget his last name. It'll come to me. So Al says to me, he was, he was going to retire. And he says to me, Arnold, I have a route that I sell furs from here down to Texas. And I'm going to retire. What, for Martin? For, what were they? He, they were jobbers. E. Lassner. They were the second biggest jobbers in, in the country. And Al, Al said to me, uh, Arnold, why don't you take my route and you travel my route and you make a good living and it'll be a lot of fun. So I said, maybe it will be. So I took the job. I went to work for E. Lassner. And I traveled for a few years from New York to Washington to Atlanta to New Orleans to my, Alabama uh, to Texas, uh, selling furs, uh, either in trunk shows or in in uh, hotel showrooms, and 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 it was uh, it was okay. It was sort of fun. A lot of work. It, I, I either would drive with the furs, fly with the furs, train with the furs, but it was you know somebody so, was so, paying me. So now you come back, and what happens one day? Now you were in the building where Theodore Keel. Yep, I was in the three fifteen. I was in three fifteen Seventh Avenue. Uh, Teddy Keel's uh, uncle uh, owned the building. And I was kibitzing with a guy by the name of Jack Walser, who was a retail furrier. And Jack said to me, Arnold, young men are not supposed to be furriers. They're supposed to be real estate people. And I said to Jack, Jack, real estate people are young, are young people who have rich families. Don't worry, Arnold. I'm going to get you a job. How are you going to do that? Don't worry. Jack took me up to Brown Harris Stevens, 14 East 47th Street, introduced me to Elliot Stoyer, who was a net lease specialist and, and a lovely man. And he took you to Shreyas for lunch, right? He took me to Shreyas for lunch, and then he took me to meet John White. John White was the premier real estate appraiser in New York City at that time, and also he created a training program in Brown Harris Stevens that didn't exist anywhere else in, in the industry. You came into the company, and you went to each department, industrial, commercial, residential, management, and then you would spend a little time in that department, and then you would decide 
what do you want to be? You want to be a leasing broker? You want to be a retail broker? You want to be... And then you would pick your field, and then you would stay in that department. So I, I, he hired me. I was the only guy that, that he hired who didn't go to college, so I, I sort of felt pretty proud of myself. And he put me with Andre Benel, who ran the industrial department. All of these names mean nothing to people today because we're all gone. This, this is, I'm talking about the time period of uh, uh, Aaron Goral, of uh, Norman Levy, uh, I'm, uh, Harry Helmsy. I'm talking about the times when real estate was a very intimate... So, so, so here's the kid from the Bronx who's in the industrial business and... You're trying to, like everyone in the real estate business, you're canvassing, you're going around. And Andre had this idea of moving the printing business from the 20s to... No, from... from, from uh, he, he was going to move him down to... to Trinity uh, to Square. Trinity. Right, the Hudson's... And that's why he kept me in the industrial department, because he was friendly with... Uh, I forget I forget everybody's last name. The Harry, church. Harry, whatever it was, who ran Trinity Church. And they were going to create a whole new printing industry down there, a global printing industry. Which they did subsequently. Yeah, and then, of course, it subsequently died, and now they get $50 a foot instead of a dollar a foot. So I, I stayed in the industrial department. I canvassed the industrial department. I would, ha, what is the real estate broker? He canvasses. That's how he gets his deals. And I would canvass the streets, the industrial streets, and I canvassed some street on, in the 20s, and I found this little printing company, and he needed more space, and I wound up moving him. To 260 West Broadway. 260 West Broadway. The American which, Thread Building. Which what today a building. is a very, very valuable condominium building. Uh, in fact, I even have a dear friend, Red Grooms, the artist, lives in that building it's, it's when it was converted. So I moved this guy to 260 West Broadway. Everybody's happy. And I get a knock on the door at uh, Brown Harris Stevens. Who is it? The FBI. Why? What's your relationship with the Daily Worker? I said, what's the Daily Worker? The guy I moved who printed this little newspaper was the guy who printed the Daily Worker. <clears throat> well, nothing really came of it, but it was sort of funny that that was the first true deal I ever made. But you know, you, when you and I met, we were talking about the many people that we do know in the real estate trade and the fact that you can be dealing with somebody you may have dealt with, a grandfather, their father, and the son. And one of the deals that you also made was with our mutual friend, Ricky Rakow, yep. who was working for his cousin, uh, Bert Resnick, or really for Jack Resnick. The first real deal I made, I made with Jack Resnick and Sons. Ricky was their lead, lead agent. And I made a deal for Elliot, I forget Elliot's last name also, Time Letter Services in 250 Hudson Street. Which they still own. Which they are still there and which Resnick still owns. I rented them a floor in 250 Hudson Street. Now, at that time, Jack Resnick was the lead partner in the company, right? Since that time, Bert Resnick, Jonathan Resnick. There's going to be somebody else after Jonathan Resnick. I think it's fascinating that a kid my age could be friends with the grandfather, the father, and the son. Three generations of Resnicks. And they're my friends. So now here's the question. You, you met Jerry Cohn. You met, you, you met Charlie Borak. You met all these guys during the life. How, how did you get to own your first building? I really didn't like doing brokerage because I never did it on a grand level. Guys do it on a grand level. Charlie Borak, when you say, you know, he could move uh, three, 400,000 for tenants. So I only did little deals. I was doing industrial deals. You make, move a guy, makes a dollar a foot rent. So I thought maybe I would buy some buildings. So uh, I met a guy um, through Jerry Cohn. I, I met Jerry when Jerry and, and Lou Smadbeck owned William A. White. And uh, a, a good friend of Jerry's was a fellow by the name of Al Marcus, who was a building inspector up at uh, Englewood Cliffs, who became friendly. So I said, Al, could we go find some buildings? So we found a building in, in, um, in, uh, right near the Washington Bridge. Uh, 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 the name of the tenant was uh, Tom Burrell Products. And we bought this building. That was the first little building I ever bought. I don't even remember when I sold it, but I don't, I don't own it anymore. But it was much more fun owning the building, even though it was insignificant, than having to always look for new tenants. But then you told me you, you met your friend David Burley. He, how did you get to be? And that's really when you got to ownership more well, buildings. That, that was an interesting event. Charlie Borak, who I became friendly with at William A. White uh, when I was there, um, didn't think he was being 
fairly treated. He wanted to become a partner in William A. White, and they didn't seem to want to make him a partner. So I said, Charlie, I, I, I know this guy, David Burley. He's got this company where he buys deals, and, and maybe you should go meet David with me, and, and uh, you would create a whole leasing department for David, and you would own the company. And I, and I put Charlie together with David. And, and uh, what Charlie was really doing, he was chumming, so he would get a better position up at William A. White. But, you know, that's okay. And I, I sort of became friendly with David at that point. And, and David said, why don't you come here? So I said, not a bad idea. And uh, fast forward, I joined David and, and, and spent many, many years with David, uh, buying deals, um, developing some deals. And and uh, and becoming an owner of uh, now there there are certain other interesting people who helped you and changed your life. One of them was Larry Friedlander. That was an interesting story. When I worked for William A. White, and uh, and Louis Madback owned the company, uh, Larry was a good friend of uh, of uh, Lou. So Lou came to me one day and said, "Arnold, my friend Larry Friedlander, a lawyer, he has a client, has a building up in Ramapo. He doesn't know what to do with it. W would you go take a look at it?" I said, "No problem." So I drove up to Ramapo. And I looked at this building. It was on Route 17, right after Motel on the Mountain, which I don't know exists, but I don't know if you guys remember Motel on the Mountain. So I looked at the building. It was a big uh, one-story uh, steel building, uh, uninsulated, uh, alongside 17 in the river. And, and Larry's client didn't know what to do with the building. So I said to Larry what I thought the building was worth. And Larry said, right, let me see if I, what I can do with my client. And Larry said, I'm going to make a deal with my client to take over the building. I said, well, that'd be great. Don't pay me a commission. Let me, let me be your partner in, in, in uh, operating this. But Larry said, okay. So I wound up being Larry's partner. He paid me a commission anyhow. And, and we took over this building and had a really fun time with it. If Michael wants me to tell more stories about it, it would be even more fun. And that's how Larry and I became friends 40-some-odd years ago. Right. And, we've, and we've still been doing all these things uh, for 40-some-odd years. Right. You, with him, you own the ground under the Crown Plaza Hotel. Right. We own a piece of that. You know, and you, you've owned other things. How do you meet the, uh, the, the guys from Austria, uh, Austria? The guys from Belgium. Belgium, the Belgians. Belgium, yeah, we, we, uh, we, 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 we've, we've done a lot of things together. And when the market got bad, we used to lend money together. Uh, I introduced uh, Larry to David. And, and, and Larry has you, been a, you know, a great force in, in, in helping David grow. So somebody that you and I remember uh, had an interesting effect in your life. A love-hate we could kibitz was Mike Wolf. Mike Wolf was Mike Wolf, Wolf. Mike Wolf was the most incredible man you ever met. He he um, he was kind and, and generous beyond belief. He he was always wheeling and dealing. How he ever got home at night, I'll never know. He made so many stops. Uh, Mike Wolf is basically a, a leasing broker. And I don't remember how I met Mike, but I said to Mike, Mike, you know, I don't want to be where I am. I'm going to move into your office and we'll hang out together. So, so we, spent, we spent several years together. And, and, and but that's how you got into the restaurant business. Yes. I mean, I, I yes, failed yes, to yes, say at the yes, beginning, yes. you are the principal owner of P.J. Clark's today, but we'll get to that in a second. So what happened? Michael, Michael was the managing agent for a building on 43rd Street or Broadway where the Century Cafe was. The Century Cafe was run by a guy by the name of Phil Scotty, who Michael was very friendly with. So I don't know how they davened this all up, but they decided they wanted to build a restaurant downtown, and we would all put this together, and we'd all go into this deal. So Michael and Phil and Irving Colvin from Ambassador Construction and a couple of other guys, we invested, and Irving built Bar, Bar Louis. Louis on... 623 Broadway. Right. And the success was unbelievable. Had the, the longest bar, right? Was, longest bar in the city. Went right through to Bleecker Street. And, and you couldn't get into the place. And it was wonderful. And the only problem with the place was everybody used to sign my name. It used to cost me two, 3000 a month in chits that I used to have to sign. But we had a lot of fun. Um, but then you got to, what, you got to the Boulevard restaurant next? And then because we were so excited there, we bought the Boulevard up on 88th Street and Broadway. And, then, and, 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 we, ran, and we ran Bar Louis for several years. And for some unknown reason, which I'll never, ever, ever understand, Bar Louis slipped away, and we wound up not even selling it, but giving it away to Michael Weinstein, who still has, after all these years, Pancho and Lefty's there. But it was uh, the, uh, the New Orleans chef. Was Paul oh, he Park. was across the street. Uh, right. Paul, Paul, Paul. Um, yeah, he was. He was, he, yeah, he was yeah. in the and by the way, this was before Chefs that neighborhood was anything. 
So, so we were the only drawer so, in the so neighborhood. Be, before I get to philanthropy and other yeah. things, let, let's talk about how do you, how do you get to uh, P.J. Clark's? I still remember the day when I when P.J. Clark's P.J. Clark's was a mistake. What had happened was somebody called me up and said P.J. Clark's is available. I said I'm not in the restaurant business. Forget about it. A week later, somebody called. Oh, P.J. Clark's is available. I said I'm not in the restaurant business. Don't bother me. And I would get call after call. In fact, one of my partners called me up and he said, oh, you know, we could buy PG Clark's. We did a whole analysis of it. I said, so what did you do with your analysis? We don't know. And I don't know, I bumped into Philip, Scotty, my old partner from, from Bar Louie, and I said, Philip, you know, PJ Clark's is available. Danny Lovetso, who owns this forever, is in financial trouble. He's totally neglected the restaurant. He's terribly ar arrears in his rent. And you could buy P.J. Clark's. Philip went ballistic. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. So we went to work on getting P.J. Clark's. And, of course, we were too overly aggressive, and we probably could have made a much more attractive So, so you opened up the first P.J.'s? No, no. Let's get to the point how we did the deal. So we met Danny, and we said to Danny, Danny, why don't you just go partners with us, and we'll take over the restaurant. We'll pay all your arrears. And he had some other guy advising him, who I won't mention the name. And the other guy said, oh, these guys are full of baloney. He'll never do anything. So we went to court, and Danny, like a fool, declared bankruptcy. And we raised our hand, and we said, we'll take it. And we paid the arrears rent, which was maybe $400,000. And we paid it to... Uh, to um, Rexon. Rexon. And we, and we negotiated a new lease. And, and Danny, who could have stayed there as a partner at 120000 a year, our rent went to $600,000 a year. And, and that was the end of Danny and the beginning of P.J. Clark's. So now P.J. Clark's then opened up in Columbus Circle. No, we opened up, we opened up in, in, uh, in uh, World Financial Center. World Financial Center, right. then Columbus Circle. Then and we had an opportunity. Uh, we always wanted to be at Columbus Circle. Not Columbus Circle. Uh, Lincoln, 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 Center. Center, Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center. Somebody introduced us to, uh, to Irving Sturm, who had the lease on, uh, on the, the restaurant in the Empire Hotel. And we sat down with Irving, who was litigating with the landlord, who was Joe Chitreed at that time. And, and uh, we, we shook hands, and we made a deal, and we went partners. And Joe Chitreed, who happens to be an incredible guy, I mean, he's... Uh, You've been so involved in giving back. As you, as you said to me, you know, if I have it, I'm going to give it away. And you have given it away. And, you, you know, there are many charities that you've been involved with, but you're a trustee, you're an overseer of the, of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, American Art, uh, and uh, National Dance. But your, your major things have been Einstein, Einstein and National Dance. Let's talk about that. If a person is really lucky enough to succeed in life and to have more money than he needs, what should he do with it? I mean, should he keep it? Should he put it away in the bank? Or should he give it away to society and help society? Because if we as individuals don't help society, society can't survive. So through Michael Wolf and Ricky Rakow, I met Einstein. And, I, and Einstein became a very important part of my life. Through a friend of mine who introduced me to Jacques D'Ambois, I met National Dance Institute. Einstein, you know, it's a medical school. National Dance Institute is an organization that Jacques D'Ambois, who is probably the premier male dancer in America uh, at New York City Ballet, when he retired, decided, let me create this thing and give back. So he created this, this organization, which brings dance to the schools all around. It's not New York anymore now. It's all around the world. And, and through dance which is not real dance. It's dance which everybody could do. You, you could make a child feel so powerful, so empowered, so successful, that you could actually change their direction. So I, I thought that was wonderful. So I've been a part of, of, of that organization. For, and let me just say one more thing. And for the first time in our 35 years of life, we've just acquired our own home. The PS... Uh... PS 90, through Ron Molas. We bought up on 148th Street off, off, uh, off uh, Lenox Avenue. We bought a 18,000-foot uh, condominium uh, where we'll have studios and offices and be able to expand our program 
Uh, Another places. important thing in your life has been the Friars Club. The Friars Club. You're the only guy who owns PJ Clark's, which is two blocks away from your never office, and you eat every day at the Friars ne Club. Never go to PJ Clark's. The Friars Club is absolutely ridiculous. It's probably the warmest intimate club in the world. I walk in there today to have to have lunch with my friend Stewie Cantor, who I have lunch with every day. And I walk into the dining room to check and see who's there. And there's Tony Haber having lunch with somebody. There's Irv Welser having lunch with somebody. There's, and I, you just walk around the room and everybody says hello. Then we sit down in the bar. We eat in the bar and there's Larry. Larry's sitting there. I haven't seen him in a long time. And there's this guy, Irving Feldman, who I never met before, who I became friends with today. And it's just such a warm and intimate. And then you were asking for me, and it was the other Stoller. Right, and I'm, then I'm paging Michael Stoller. And I say, get me Michael Stoller. We'll drive downtown together. And, and Franco Capitelli, our captain, for 50 years comes in and said, it's the wrong Michael Stoller. Okay. Hey, you know, at least the Friars has two Mike Stoller. That's, that's a fascinating. You, you, you know, that's, that's the Mike fascinating Stoller. over there. Two Mike Stoller. So, yeah, you know, let, let's talk. Uh, there's Mimi. How many years have you been married to Mimi? Well, we're married uh, 14 years. We're together 25 years. 20, 25 years of, uh, of just wonderful happiness. It's really nice to be, uh, to be mated with somebody who makes you happy and you look forward to being with every year. Uh, but, you know, besides giving back, you like having parties, you like having fun. Oh, yeah. You know, as I said, I was with you in your 55th, your 60th, 65th. I missed the 70th. Michael remembers my birthdays better than me. My 70th birthday, we had a funeral. My 65th birthday, we had an AARP party. My 60th birthday, we had a bar mitzvah. My 55th birthday, we had... We just had dinner at Mulligan's. We just had dinner at Mulligan's. But they've been, they've, been, they've, been wonderful. they've been wonderful parties. We, we get all our friends together, and, and we celebrate the fact that we're still here. Uh, that ain't easy. You know, being here is uh, sort of a job. So, you know... For the kid from, you know, from the Bronx, who, who really loves, I mean, I, I, with cars, got a car collection. But, you know, I still remember one of the days that we went to an Einstein function and we stopped on the road. You're driving in this Bentley and you had to pick up a hubcap. That's right. Because, you know, the kid from the Bronx. On Bruckner Boulevard. On Bruckner Boulevard. Never forgets and never changes. Right. So, Arnold, you were indeed a friend. You are indeed a builder of New York, and you are truly a New York City life story. And thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you, Michael. This is a, a big honor for me. Thank you. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns & Gian Tomasi, Grubb & Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa & Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner & Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.